The Jaeger will tell you, it was cold, it, there was a lot of vibration, it was not a terribly comfortable experience. And every time he bought, mounted the X-1 in flight, it was the same. To climb into the X-1, kind of a screwy system, you went down, slid down a ladder, and then went in the side feet first, and then Jack Ridley would bring the door down, hold it, and I'd lock it on from the inside. And you had no way of getting out. If you tried to go out, you'd probably end up on that real razor-sharp wing, probably probably slicing you in two. But, you know, after the first two or three glide flights, I felt right at home in the airplane. In a series of carefully graduated flights, Jaeger inched the X-1 towards Mach 1. And then, just 36 hours before the scheduled breakthrough flight, something happened that would threaten to scrub his chances permanently. Well, he was out at Pancho Barnes Happy Bottom Riding Club, which is only about two miles from here, and was, yes, horseback riding that night. He was coming back in. It was just after twilight. He thought the gate was open. He slammed into it. Uh, he went down and cracked two ribs, patched them up in town, and like any pilot would do at the time, didn't say anything about it. The X-1 door, when it came, you held it against it. You had to take a lever and, and lock it just like a bank vault. Well, I couldn't do it. I was so hurt so bad. I talked to Jack about it. He's the only guy that knew it, that I was really hurting. And he said, let's take a look. He got this 10-inch piece of broomstick. He said, and if you stick it in with your left hand in this lever, and then you use your left arm to close that lever. And that's exactly the way I did it. We have been looking for that broomstick as an artifact ever since, but it has disappeared to history. With Jack Ridley's high-tech solution at hand, Jaeger gently settled himself into the frozen cockpit of the X-1. At 23,000 feet, the B-29 mothership slipped into a shallow dive, and after a brief countdown, Ridley pulled the release. He was dropped literally like a bomb. The X-1 was suspended from conventional bomb shackles. And as soon as he was clear, he would activate the first motor. That would give him forward motion. He'd be get out ahead of the bomber, the launch aircraft, then pitch it up and go on up and then follow his flight profile. Jaeger climbed into the clear morning sky, giving himself plenty of room in case anything went wrong. His meter only went to Mach 1, and as he soared above 30,000 feet, the needle jumped a bit past the marker. Jaeger calmly announced to Ridley, that his Mach meter had just gone screwy on him. Watching from the ground, observers were startled by their first sonic boom. The first sonic boom heard anywhere. When Jaeger went through the sound barrier and made the world's first sonic boom, uh, half of the people there that were watching thought he'd blown up. They had had no experience with this phenomenon. Jaeger was still climbing straight up. With the transonic buffeting smoothed out and his controls responding perfectly, he glided the X-1 to a perfect landing on the lake bed. Chuck Yeager had dispelled the myth of the sound barrier. Almost immediately, Walt Williams received a high-level phone call informing him that his program had just been reclassified top secret. The floating tail and other innovations that made the flight possible were to be kept from the public until further notice. This dusty ride on the Muroc flight line would be the only parade Chuck Yeager would receive. The public may not have been aware of the goings-on out in California's high desert, but the flying community was. Soon others were heading this way as competition heated up to achieve and hold each new speed record. It was a competition that Chuck Yeager found himself getting thoroughly caught up in, and one that very nearly killed him. <laughs> 